Cincinnati has been sidelined most of the season. Yet the Dolphins continue to be undefeated. Reese's broken leg has introduced a new Dolphin hero, but an old Orange Bowl face, Earl Morrill. The 38-year-old quarterback has done so well that going into last Sunday's game, Miami had the opportunity to be the first team this year to clinch a division title. A victory over the Jets would accomplish this, and it is only week number 10. Greasy's injury has brought about an interesting rematch today. Or in this same Orange Bowl in 1969, Earl Morrill, then a Colt, was the victim of Joe Namath's guaranteed Super Bowl upset. Today, as four years ago, the pressure is on Namath and New York. Well, the Jets must duel for their very lives. The Eastern Division title is all but beyond their reach, but they still can squeeze into the playoffs as the wild card in the AFC. So this is a big one for both teams as the Miami Dolphins try to clinch its title and run the unbeaten streak to 10 games in a bid to attain the first unbeaten season since the Cleveland Browns did it 24 years ago. Well, the New York Jets, led by Joe Namath, today is a fight for survival. I'm Tom Brookshire, and this is the NFL Game of the Week. New York's chances for an upset look dim indeed when on their first series of the game from deep in his own territory, Namath's pass was intercepted by Dick Anderson, number 40. With the game barely a minute old, the Dolphins had already made a big break in this important ball game. This is the kind of play Miami has been getting all season from the no-name defense. Several plays later, Earl Morrill hit Howard Twilley, slanting in the end zone, and Miami was on the board's first seven to nothing. Again, it was Howard Twilley who made the big play for six points. This is the little guy who every summer camp loses his job to faster men. But when the season begins, Howard Twilley somehow finds his way into the lineup. This year, such talented receivers as young Otto Stowe and Marlon Briscoe, who Miami obtained in a big trade, are sitting on the bench watching the tough Twilly star. Another look at that score from our end zone camera shows Twilly barely held onto the ball as he drew first blood from number 21 Steve Tannen in what would be a classic duel between the little receiver and the cornerback all day long. Miami defense in a five-man zone to negate Namath's long ball striking ability, Broadway Joe was to do a lot of throwing to his fine running backs, number 44, John Riggins, and number 32, Emerson Boozer. Both, of course, are fine runners and good receivers, and together they give the Jets as fine a pair of setbacks as there is in the NFL. Boozer leads the league in touchdowns with 13. And Riggins, number 44, is third in the AFC in rushing. After the two jetbacks moved the ball into Dolphin territory, Joe Namath unleashed a pass to Rich Castor that brought the Jets to the Miami 11-yard line. Getting great protection from his offensive line, Namath returned to Castor again by spearing him over the middle. Castor's catch brought him just one yard short of the goal line. From the one, Namath returned to the ground, and his toughest runner, Riggins, who ran over free safety Jake Scott for the touchdown that tied the game seven apiece.
Any thoughts of a runaway, the Dolphin crowd of over 80,000 might have entertained after Miami's early touchdown had to be dispelled by the methodical ease with which the Jets marched downfield against the Miami defense. Kickoff following New York's score went to Mercury Morris, who burned to the 20 where he endured one of the hardest hits you'll ever see in football. Morris's fumble was recovered by Jim Mandich. A slow motion look at the great play made by number 63, bomb squatter Roy Kirksey, shows the force of his tackle, the fumble, and Mandich's recovery. Despite the great year he's having, Mercury still retains a tendency to cough up the football, and this was to be a big factor in today's game. Ironically, Morris got up from the tackle, but Kirksey, laying thin on the poly turf, did not. Morris's fumble set off a series of dropsy for Miami, as tight end Marv Fleming muffed a third down possession pass for Merle Morrill. This betrayal of a perfectly thrown pass by Fleming continued into the second period when the next time they had the ball, Fleming free and clear at the 40 dropped another one. Fleming's real value has always been his fine blocking. Nevertheless, this is one of Miami's few weaknesses on offense, a tight end who can't catch the football. Fleming's muff was on first down. And on second, Morrill again went long, this time to Howard Twilley, who had beaten Steve Tannen down the right sideline. But Twilley was ruled out of bounds, and again, Miami was thwarted. Then on third down, Mercury Morris fulfilled a promise he had shown on his kickoff return by bobbling a pitch out. New York recovered at the Miami 37. It capped a horrendous series of miscues for Miami, and even the breaks to one big one apiece. Namath quickly capitalized on it with a strike to Rich Castor. And the Jets had the lead and the momentum 14 to 7. With the score of 14 to 7, New York had the ball in their own 38 when John Riggins broke loose for a big game. Riggins' great 40-yard run put the ball on Miami's 14 and gave the Jets an excellent chance to balloon their lead to 14 points. But there, the no-name defense and their leader, Captain Nick Bonacani, came through once again. Bonacani read a pass over the middle intended for Boozer and made the interception to save a certain score. and the Miami attack continued to be inconsistent. And New York soon had the ball right back when W.K. Hicks cut in front of Otto Stowe and carried the theft all the way to the Miami 9. New York again had used a Miami turnover to gain great field position and again had an excellent opportunity to take control of the ball game. But once again, the Dolphin defense came through in magnificent fashion. When Manny Fernandez batted down Namath's third down pass, Bobby Howfield was called on and successfully kicked the field goal that brought the score to 17 to 7. now fallen 10 points behind and with less than three minutes left in the first half they finally pulled themselves together and moved the football unsurprisingly Howard Twilley got them started on a 22 yard slant between Tannen and Hicks 
Then one play later, Earl Morrow cranked up his 38-year-old arm and let it fly. Again, Twilly had badly beaten Tannen. Though he was out at the one, the little guy had again proved to be the big gun. In Paul Warfield's absence because of an injured ankle, it was vital that someone take up the slack, and today Howard Twilly was the man that got it done. From the one, the call went to Larry Zaka, who was crunched in midair and lost the ball for the first time since the Super Bowl. But Miami guard Bob Kuchenberg recovered. Miami had another crack at it, and Mercury Morris flew over Zonka's block into the end zone for the touchdown. The Orange Bowl's huge crowd reached for their hankies in their now traditional salute, for their team had come roaring back. Despite being outplayed for most of the first half, they now trail the Jets by only three at the end of the first two quarters. The Jets had forged their 17-14 lead by limiting the Zonka kick Morris agency to just 57 yards rushing in the first half. So in the second half, after an exchange of punts, Earl Morrill turned to another runner, and the 38-year-old legs of Earl Morrill showed remarkable quickness as he ran 31 yards to put Miami back on top. It's ironic that Morrill would score on such a scramble, for when he took over for scrambler extraordinaire Bob Greasy, that element was supposed to be lacking, and an immobile quarterback was a possible chink in the Dolphin armor. Also ironic is that with runners like Zonka, Morris, and Kick, Morrill's 31-yard run was the longest Dolphin run from scrimmage this season. For the first time since early in the first quarter, Miami led, and the defense looked like they would make the lead stand up as they shot down the Jets in their next series. But now, faced with fourth and punt, the Jets got a break. Keep your eyes on the kicker. Number 45, Curtis Johnson, almost blocked Steve O'Neill's punt. But he couldn't stop before running into O'Neill. Automatic first down for the Jets. The Jets would maintain possession on their 40, and Namath took advantage of the big break. With a third and 12, watch number 40, Dick Anderson, as Namath's pump fake brings him in a step and enables number 13, Don Maynard, to break by him. play worked for 41 yards, though Anderson claimed Maynard caught the pass out of bounds. A repeat reveals not only why the play worked, but that the referee's call on the catch was a difficult one. Anderson had been sucked in by Namus pump fake to Riggins, swinging out of the backfield, and watched Maynard try to drag his left foot inbounds. In this split instant, you be the referee. You'll agree it's a tough job. Maynard's catch brought the ball to the Miami 20. And after chipping away to the four, Namath made a strong fake to Emerson Boozer, put the ball on his hip, and hit tight end Wayne Stewart. The Jets now led 24 to 21 as the lead changed hands for the fourth time. On a repeat, watch how well Boozer carried out his fake, actually diving into the line. Then notice that Jake Scott, number 13, has come in toward the line, thinking Namath was on a bootleg run. That was all Namath needed to drop the ball over him and on to Stewart. Three with plenty of time left, Earl Morrill went with Miami's strength, the run. Watch all pro guard Larry Little, number 66, wipe out Phil Wise, number 27, to spring Zonka loose for 18 yards. With the ball at midfield and the Jets looking for the run, Earl Morrill hit Otto Stowe, who made a nice catch despite early Thomas's close, close coverage. But that was the extent of the drive as the Jets stopped Miami on three consecutive plays. At 
the start of the fourth quarter, Garo Yepremian tried the tying field goal from the 42. Yepremian thought he made the kick as he ran off without watching the complete flight of the ball. But when he turned back, no amount of body English could put the ball through. And his expression changed to gloom as Miami still trailed by three in the fourth period. Two plays later, Miami had the ball again when number 42, Cliff McLean, went into the line with the ball, but emerged without it. Dick Anderson, whose interception set up Miami's first score, made the recovery to set up their last. With the Dolphin line sealing off jet pursuit coming from the left, Morris went 14 yards for the touchdown. On the run, Mercury Morris showed he has more than just speed and moves as he powered over Phil Wise to get the score. For the fifth time, the lead had changed hands as Miami now led 28 to 14. And repeating the play reveals why Miami had taken the lead. Set up by the defense, the Dolphin line had created a hole for one of their tough backs. Watch number 67, Bob Kuchenberg, bump number 60, Larry Grantham, giving Morris the only hole he needs to show his moves and that power. Touchdown was Morris's fifth in the last two games, and he has asserted himself as a starter and has broken up the Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid tandem, having forced Jimmy Kick to the sidelines with his performance this season. Miami now led by four, and after their defense held, appeared ready for one of their patented clock-consuming drives, but they made an uncharacteristic mistake. Earl Morrill, though hit by no one, fumbled. And Jerry Philbin beat him to the ball. Here the Dolphins showed why they are still undefeated. Though the offense had turned over the ball, the defense bailed them out by following up the Jets, not allowing any further advance, though Riggins made one of the great minus two-yard runs in recent NFL history. Dolphin defense had done it, and now the offense would take the cue and pack the game away as they ground out yardage and ground time off the clock. Mercury Morris gained 88 yards in the second half. He went over the century mark. But the Dolphins couldn't run off all the time as the Jets held for one last shot at victory. Zonka's fumble came after the whistle. A break for Miami, but they got an even bigger one when forced to punt as Joey Jackson, number 86, ran into Larry Seifel, bringing a first down and keeping the Miami drive alive. Like every punter, Seifel has developed a first-class dying swan routine to draw penalties, but this time Seifel was really hurt, having strained his knee, and illustrates why the roughing the kicker penalty is a real safeguard in pro football. A punter is highly vulnerable to injury until well after he's landed, after he makes the punt. Though Seifel had paid with pain, the penalty enabled Miami to keep the ball. And relying mostly on Morris, they were able to run off most of the remaining time.
Though the Dolphins did not completely run out the clock, they forced the Jets to use all their timeouts. So that when Dick Anderson, standing in for Seifel, punted, the Jets got the ball in their own nine with no timeouts remaining and little time left. Though they got off four plays, the Jets could not score against the Dolphins' prevent defense. And Miami had the victory. Don Shula's 101st victory in just 10 years of head coaching was the Dolphins' 10th straight win in 1972. After only 10 weeks, the Dolphins, still undefeated, had clinched the AFC Eastern Division title, the first step in what looks like a return to the Super Bowl. It is the earliest that a team has clinched a playoff first since San Diego did it in 61. But the Jets still have a shot, too. They had nearly beaten the Dolphins, and if they continue to play well and can win their last four games, they might make the playoffs as a runner-up team. Perhaps Don Shula's Dolphins and Weave Eubanks Jets have not seen the last of each other this season. <laughs>